You are tuned in to Burner Podcast. All right, it's uh, episode 81, and it is 123 days till the man burns as of this recording. Um, so as you all probably know by now, Burning Man's main co-founder, Larry Harvey, passed away last week. He was 70 years of age and left one hell of a legacy. Um, there have already been lots written about him and lots more to come, I'm sure. Uh, today's episode will be a very simple dedication to Larry. No interviews, no DJ sets. You may have noticed that today's show is uh, less than an hour. Uh, we, we considered taking the week off, uh, but that didn't quite feel right. We kicked around the idea of doing a round table, but that felt forced. So uh, Navjeet, our music editor and producer of Alkaline Podcast, came up with the idea of reading people's messages to Larry. BMorg created Larry.BurningMan.org, where they've been posting the messages people have been sending them. We didn't grab any of those, but looked around in our own circles to see some of what people have been writing and saying and posting. Uh, producer Rebel, stationed out of Fly Ranch these days, by the way, uh, hit the ground hard on this episode and collected some pretty epic stories. And uh, listener, I'm not going <laughs> to... I'll be straight up with you. Um, what you're about to hear is not like audiobook professional reading. Um, it's simply myself, uh, Navjeet, and our associate producer, Tori, reading some of the messages and words people have posted and shared with us. Um, <laughs> not very well, by the way. <laughs> I mean, Tori sounds great. Um, but the, uh, this episode had a lot of technical issues to deal with, and the past couple of weeks have been very emotionally complicated for all of us. And it's funny that this less than an hour long special episode took longer to put together than these things usually do. Um, the three of us never got to personally uh, meet Larry. He was always like one or two degrees separation away. And all of this is quite strange for us to feel strong feelings about the passing of a person that we never met. Uh, this, is a, this is a new experience. But we ultimately concluded that there just is no way not to mark this extremely important moment in Burning Man's history in the timeline of this show. So the next hour of audio will be uh, the three of us reading messages that people have written about Burning Man, about Larry, about not knowing Larry and what he meant, about having seen Larry once, or about knowing him very, very well and having a deep personal connection with him. It's a variety of stories. Um, Navjeet organized and scripted sort of which one of us would be reading which ones. And um, it, we start out a little clunky. <laughs> um, then it continues to be clunky. I'm not going to lie to you uh, because this is Burning Man and everything is just kind of zip tied and duct taped together sometimes. But uh, but we ease, in, we ease into it and we start to laugh. And I think that what you're hearing is that we start to really process what his passing means to us. And by the end, I think we all felt ready to take on this next chapter of our Burning Man adventure. I can tell you that just while recording this intro, I feel differently than I did yesterday when we were recording the, um, the talk. So today's episode is us simply holding space. If you're a new listener, today's show may be a, a bit confusing as it is not our normal format, but uh, even if you're brand new to Burning Man, I invite you to sit and hold space with us for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, all these messages that we'll be reading uh, will be posted in the episode notes as well, so you can find them at burnerpodcast.com if your particular podcast platform isn't displaying them properly. Today's episode is entitled, So Long, Larry. 
I go by Mr. Rosh, even though nobody calls me Mr. Welcome to Burner Podcast. First one is from Lynn Marie Morsky. I attended my first burn amid much strife in my capoeira life. I had wanted to play in the orchestra that leads the capoeira games, but my low status in the group prevented me from doing so. In capoeira, your cord belt color is a rank like any other martial art, and only the higher cords are allowed to play instruments, but not on the playa. I went to capoeira class my first day and there were no chords, no hierarchy. When it came time to play, I asked who was going to lead the orchestra. They said whoever could lead. So I led for the first time ever and I've never looked back. Thanks Larry for creating a hierarchy less paradise for me to find my strength and my home in the orchestra. This next one's from Arthur Mahanumani. Mamumani. Mamumani? Mamumani. I love it. He's the designer Arthur. of the temple. Oh. Yeah. This is from Arthur Mamumani. Larry Harvey, you are in our thoughts. The Temple 2018 will be here for you and for the community that you have so deeply inspired and changed for the better. This one is from Amy Volger. Vogler. <laughs> the result of your little beach bonfire party has changed the course of my life in so many aspects and exposed me to more love, compassion, and creativity than I thought possible within the community, and within myself. Thanks for your participation. <laughs> Kat Ripley, rest in peace, Larry Harvey. Thank you so much for all that you've done for humanity. I think it would be impossible to overstate the positive impact you've made across the globe. I don't know if I can make one one hundredth of an impact on this world as much as you have, but I promise I will try. You, get, you gave me all the long ones right now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> this one is uh, from Absinthia Vermouth. I first remember Larry when I was still at Burning Man, two days after the man burden in 1995. I celebrated my 25th year on Playa, fell madly in love with Burning Man, and stayed up to clean up. Stayed after to clean up. I just couldn't leave. A year earlier, I had moved to San Francisco, a dream I had since I first visited as a young girl. I never dreamed I would find something like Burning Man in an incredible location like Black Rock Desert, and there I was, home. Two years later, I remember Larry pulling my then-boyfriend, Paul, and me into a meeting late one night on Halapai Playa. I'm pretty sure I'm saying that right. Uh, we were there with maybe two dozen others as he explained that the sheriff had relieved the gate of its cash, and he needed us to walk around and collect cash donations from participants. Of course we did. He offered me a lifetime ticket to Burning Man for $500. I was a starving artist and couldn't afford it, but more importantly, I thought it was a terrible idea and a huge waste of money. There was no way that this thing would continue. Turns out Larry was much of a pit bull, as much of a pit bull with Burning Man as I had been with my absinthe. That was right after, right around the, the time I started bootlegging Absinthe, and Larry was a huge fan, perhaps my biggest. Since his passing, a friend told me that there was a night when Larry 
Flash and Peter were craving absinthe and set out to Black Rock, set out into Black Rock City to find some, to find me. As they wandered through the camps asking if Absinthia was camped there, they left a trail of participants asking, was that Larry Harvey? <laughs> I have memories of him at the Anon Salons holding court with neon green glass in his hand. One memory in particular stands out where he had five glasses and was quite belligerent. <laughs> Marianne was there. And while she was annoyed with his behavior, we also found it hilarious and endearing. A performer named Magneta was there that night and met him on that fifth glass of absinthe and then vowed all of, uh, and then wowed all of us in circles with knife on her scarved head. Wow. I once witnessed Larry managing his fame. I was in first camp and saw him on the poop deck. I walked up. It's not really a poop. It's not really like a poop thing. I don't know what a poop deck means. But I, yeah. right. I walked up and say, to say hello, and he said a very formal, yes, hello, without looking up. A moment later, he did and caught my eye. Oh, hello, dear. How are you? It was clear that he had heard hello, Larry, often from people he didn't know. It was interesting to be treated like a stranger and then recognized by a man whom everyone knew. Ah, uh, playa celebrity. But of course, he was more than that. So much more. The moment... That moment made me stop and think what it must be like to walk through Black Rock City as Larry Harvey. Have you ever thought about that? That last time I saw Larry was Burn Night 2017. I was walking back home from uh, I was walking back from the burn to Marianne's absinthe bar to serve my absinthe, my Burn Night tradition. I had witnessed a man dive into the fire and I was completely shell-shocked. Wow, that was this past year, huh? Yeah. We didn't have that nice, warm welcome that we usually have. It was too intense uh, of an evening for all of us. My favorite story of Larry occurred burn night 2015. I arrived at Marianne's pop-up absinthe bar and no one was around. I found a black baseball cap that said meow in the bar and put that on without a second thought. Wandered over to first camp to drum up some interest. I walked in and Larry caught my eye and gave me a huge smile. Now Larry had never, ever flirted with me before. He was always an uncle to me, my crazy uncle Larry. But on this night, I was dressed as, as Marianne with an all-black outfit, a long blonde wig, and the last edition uh, was the meow hat. Perhaps the only night I have ever not worn green on playa. I was Absinthia dressed as Marianne, serving Absinthia's absinthe in Marianne's pop-up bar. I'm starting to understand this person now. <laughs> Larry didn't leave my sight side all night. He escorted me back to the bar and I served him and many others absinthe that evening. A lot of absinthe. I said meow a lot. What else does one say when they are mimicking Maid Marion? Larry told me that the story of how he had almost been arrested earlier that night during the burn. The man was taking forever to burn and Larry was getting worried. He also wasn't wearing his hat. I had witnessed him toss it into the crowd at the GLC a few years prior. He just wasn't recognizable without it. And beneath the slowly burning man, a young Leo, as Larry described him, stepped, stopped him and asked him what he was doing so close to the man. With people lying around on the ground watching it burn. I am worried about it far falling, Larry said. Well, that's not your concern. Get out of this area. Listen, son, Larry started to say. Son, don't you condescend me. Now leave this area before I have you arrested and taken away. Larry loved the story and told it several times that evening. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. You created a world I never dreamt I would find. Thanks to you, I found my island of misfit toys and a place where I belong. I came to the playa as a shy photographer hiding behind my camera, and there I found my dreams, my crazy absinthe-induced green fairy dreams, and made them a reality. I am a different person now. We all are. Like all of us, you are flawed. You are human. You are loved. You and your friends gave us the landscape to make magic happen. You left one hell of a trace, my friend. Cheers. Rebecca waits. I only met him a few times, so I don't really have any stories. I just know that he loved Church Trap and talked about it in interviews. 
found out after that he carried a picture of it in his journal. Finding that out meant a lot to me. Only story I have was one on his birthday at a party at headquarters. I didn't know anyone and am a bit shy. Jennifer Razor invited me, and when I got there, she told me to go say hi to Larry. When I tried to introduce myself, he snapped. I just woke up, so I ran away. Huh. When Jennifer asked me later if I said hi to him, I said I tried to, but it didn't go over very well. She told me to go say hi again. This time, I caught him in the line for tacos and started to say who I was. His response, who? Larry, it's me, Rebecca. Rebecca Waits, who did church trap. And then I got the biggest hug from Larry, and we talked for a moment. It was awesome. I'll never forget that. Danielle White, Larry Harvey passed into his next journey. Thank you for the amazing growth, change, and experiences that this incarnation brought to my life. I am extremely grateful. Unicorn emoji, thank you emoji. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that stuck with me many years ago, I went to a speaking engagement. He was getting a lot of questions about all the rules. His response was, it's amazing how your thought process changes when you're responsible for people's lives. I'm not sure why, but I've thought, I've thought on that moment many times. This one is from Sonia Sophia. This man's love has changed the world. He changed my world. He changed the lives of millions forever with his dedication to art, freedom, radical self-reliance, and community. This pic was taken exactly a month ago, the Smithsonian's Burning Man exhibit. And my comment, uh, since this is a podcast, you cannot look at the picture that she's representing. <laughs> but the, uh, she says, the golden beam, like an accidental foreshadow of him beginning his flight home a few days later and arriving in the infinite today. Thank you, Larry Harvey, for making this world a better, brighter, and more beautiful place. I'm so grateful to you. We all are. From where you are now, I know you can finally see what a gift you have given us. May we make you proud by how we keep the fire burning. Oh, cool. I got halcyons. This is very fitting, I think. <laughs> I am no Larry Disciple. I have not studied his writings or made stained glass of his image. My reflections are mostly my own projections. But the role he played in my life is profound. His legacy has influenced me more than Jesus. We met half a dozen times over the last 20 years. It was only in our last encounter over a meal at Essalion in 2016 that he indicated he knew who I was. Before that, I always felt that I was a bit of a nuisance, just another fan eager for a selfie with the I Met Larry story. But it didn't bother me. Larry didn't ask to be the mascot of Burning Man. He was always gracious, and I was always grateful for the brief moments of his time. My gratitude required no reciprocity. I was especially happy that I was able to give him a patented, dirty, vibrating hug in 2002. It involves pounding on the recipient's back with a huge fur-covered foam wrist cuffs while pressing against the person's crotch and vibrating jock strap. See first, <laughs> wow, okay. I was soaring with pride when he grinned and said, now that was something, when I released him from the hug. My favorite Larry story was the previous year when I asked to be in a photo shoot uh, with him for the image above. This was his post, actually. While waiting for the photographer, Julian Cash, to set up, a woman stormed into the camp holding the who, what, where guidebook. She was looking for Larry Harvey and looked pissed. She explained that she had hiked all the way across the city to visit a camp that publicized a pancake breakfast, only to discover that when she arrived at the destination, that their camp was empty. Larry took a drag from his cigarette and said, you walked all the way across the playa? She said, yes. And when you got there, there wasn't anybody even there? No. Larry took another drag. And you didn't see anything good along the way? <laughs> he was inspiring not because he rallied the community to follow him, but instead role modeled a fierce personal authenticity in the face of cultural expectations. He was a reluctant leader who always seemed a little surprised that people were listening to him. Maybe he even had a trace of disdain for followers of any kind, even those who followed him. 
He was like the Zen master who sends away the student who comes looking for a guru. He would share his thoughts, but not take responsibility for Burning Man. He was fierce and humble and didn't take any of it too seriously. I've seen several people post this week, rest in peace, Larry. Burning Man will never be the same. I think that statement would have made Larry snarl. It's totally off base. Yes, Larry started the fire and penned the principles. With many passionate people, he helped create the container. But this blaze rages independently of any person or group. As burners, we don't follow through the vision of Larry. We step into the established space and then all make Burning Man what it is. This model of leadership and community is one of the most powerful things I've learned from Burning Man. Black Rock City doesn't look a certain way. It invites radical self-expression and trusts that when balanced with civic responsibility and the other principles, everything will work out. For me and so many others, it has worked out the ways that have drastically shaped my entire life. Not shaped from any external script, but allowed my inner truth to take shape authentically. And um, he says at the end, Each year we burn the man. Each year we celebrate the transitory nature of all things. Each year we remind ourselves of how impermanent and precious everything is. Your life was art, Larry. A perfect playa performance. Your physical form may become ashes, but the ripples of your art have changed the world forever. I have no doubt you saw plenty of good stuff along the way. I really like that. Yeah. Your life was art. Larry, your perfect platforms. Halcyon has a way with words. Yeah, he clearly I, does. That's beautiful. I agree with all of what he said right now. Yeah. All right. This next one's from Zach Sirivello. I'll miss this guy a lot. Also, this shirt is in my closet. <laughs> That's in reference to a f- photo where he's wearing a shirt that I believe is from Larry Harvey. Yeah, and it's oh actually- no, it's a reference of Larry Harvey wearing the shirt, right? Yes, and then he yeah, okay. Well, because the photo that we posted was with Larry wearing that shirt, and then Zach is right. now wearing the shirt. Um, yeah, and he was actually wearing that shirt at the Bombay Beach by an Ellie the other right. week. Yes, I saw that. Yeah. Talk about a conversation piece, right? Yeah. This one is from Anel. I believe Larry had a yearning, a calling we all share in our hearts, a craving for expression, for love, for freedom. His blessing was his curse. That pain brought him to a point of surrender where he gave in and created a space for this expression to be fulfilled. Something that so many of us crave for was born and continues to grow across the world beyond anyone's expectation. The birth of a new culture, which now influences the world. As a modern world, We have lost our rituals and our pilgrimage. We have lost touch with our connection to each other in pursuit of personal gains. Thanks to Larry, we have an avenue to give and share our love and our hearts. Now it's up to us to continue the work and spread the message. This one is from John Simmons. For the last 12 years, I would meet with Larry at first camp on Sunday after burn night. We would talk about all things Burning Man. That meeting would usually be around 2 or 3 p.m., would last for about an hour or so. Sometimes I would bring a quest. Larry was the one who encouraged me to become a regional when they split the Southern California region. At first, I did not want to because I wanted to create Maham from the the outside. He said, Mayhem. I it thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I thought it was a, um, I thought it was like a camp or something. <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> That's valid. He, s- <laughs> he said I could be more effective doing that from the inside out. Mayhem, yeah. Uh, our, our meetings for the first, uh, for the last six years since I became a regional took on a whole new perspective. I will miss my friend and mentor. This one is from Charlie Dayburn. Without you and Burning Man, my life path might probably be still pretty miserable. My first burn was 2011. At this burn, I met my heart for the very first time and everything goes banana after that. Since then, I discovered my connection to the true beauty of sunrises. I have never missed one in seven years. I discovered my hidden potential as a composer in my inner superhero avatar, Dayburn, at 2013. My father's photo was burned with the temple at 2016. 
I made my decision to become a life coach at 2017. Many monumental life decisions and self-discoveries were all made at Burning Man. I had my last glimpse of you last year at the man's opening ceremony, which I was the composer. It's almost too hard to believe I could be serving this part for the man. This year, I will dedicate my fifth annual Sunrise Assembly to you. Without you and Burning Man, none of this would be created. Thank you, Larry. I am I forever owe my deepest gratitude to you. This next one's from Liz Devon. Larry's impact in my life is that I've seen and know anything is possible. We can do better together. We can be better together. Judgment is a dead end road. Acceptance, inclusivity, love, and expression of love is where it's at. Larry's legacy is astounding. We'll continue to change the world for the better into eternity. I'm so saddened to hear the news about Larry's passing, but I know he had a very full life and was loved by many. <clears throat> Rest in peace, brother. So, all right, strap in. This is a long one. Um, this is from Jerry James. Uh, it's, I, I believe it's from a piece that he'd written. It's from um, an essay, yeah. That, yeah, an essay that he'd written that he sent over. Uh, Jerry was... Jerry built the very first man ever. <laughs> oh, wow. Gosh, so, if you get um, tired, we could always take turns. <laughs> on Jerry's? <laughs> on Jerry's. Okay. All right. <laughs> Around 1985, Larry Harvey and I became best friends. He was as lost and confused as I was, young and full of energy and scared to death. I, I looked to him, hoping to find assurance and truth. He had a good rap, combining concepts from all kinds of stuff like Freud, Emson, and Joseph Conrad. He and I read Nostromo along with uh, other friends. I have been reading, there's, there's, good Lord, Celine Bukowski and playing Bob Marley and Captain Beefheart. We met through Dan Richman, who sometimes had people over to play music, get high and get laid. Larry was working as a gardener for Edgewood, a healthcare institution, and I was a carpenter. We both had young sons. We'd take them out for hikes and some laughs the off-reference unsuccessful relationship from which I was allegedly recovering was with someone named Paula. Ooh, that's poetic. I was living off and on with Maria Majeski in Bernal, uh, Bernal Heights, San Francisco. He in a large apartment building in Alamo Square with his roommate, Dan Miller. I also had a 12-year-old son, Jeremy, in Boise from where I'd relocated in 1980. Larry's from Portland originally. At that point of my life, I had the unfortunate tendency to adopt certain friends who I considered strong male figures as father figures. I did this with Larry. He read a lot and expressed ideas with confidence. To me, this translated as strengths. So I looked up to him and sometimes mimicked him. I had a lot of strengths and many weaknesses. Admiring and trusting Larry was a weakness that would take its toll. Larry had been reading The Golden Bow, an anthropological work that references the history of burning human effigies. He had also attended in previous years events at Baker Beach that included burning a variety of objects. I'm not sure why Larry didn't continue those beach traditions with the, the others, but when he asked if I wanted to build an effigy and burn it for the summer solstice, my response was, why not? June 20th, 1986. Earlier that day, Larry and I had spent a couple of hours at Ellen Into's, Flash's mother-in-law, garage in Noe Valley, taking some witchcrafts into a crude figure, the first Burning Man. It only took us a couple of hours to craft a figure, about 10 feet tall. I stapled burlap inside to approximate skin and uh, provide kindling. We grabbed our girlfriends and kids, invited a couple of more folks, and headed to the beach. Arriving at Baker Beach, there were about 10 of us, including our girlfriends and kids. We parked in the lot and started down the beach. Coincidentally, we passed Dan Richmond leaving as we were making our way down the quarter mile of sand to the north end of the beach. We said hi, but nobody stopped. 
You're very lucky if you get a sunny sunset at the beach in San Francisco, especially on the summer solstice. So it was high just to be there with the waves crashing and sun on our backs as we walked straight through the Golden Gate Bridge above us. Being a typical San Francisco afternoon, the modest sunlight was soon overtaken by a foggy breeze. Arriving at the end of the beach, I planted the man in the sand. We shared a few drinks and laughs. And as the sun set, I doused the figure with a gallon of gasoline and added fire. It burned furiously. It was, after all, gasoline. <laughs> the handful of strangers in the vicinity joined us. One had a tambourine and started chanting something like, burn, fire, burn, which, though on one hand uh, was embarrassing, somehow suggested that there was something special about this modest incendiary sacrifice. It burned quickly, and we left soon after. Inspired by the event, we spoke of it later, and again, from time to time over the following year, we decided to retreat, but we decided to repeat it when the next solstice rolled around. 1987. That's when Maria and I were living in a warm in a worn out mansion on Cap Street with three roommates. It was groovy. Big place with a couple of fireplaces. There had to be some lost stories behind it. I built the second Burning Man on the back deck. It was an awesome open space. Sunny, framed by exterior walls and felt warm and free. This time it was about 12 feet tall. Larry helped with the uh, embellishing of its head. It being still a pretty modest assembly, I spent a couple of weekends building it. This time, we spread the word, so there was about 35 friends and acquaintances at Baker Beach for another cold night of burning the man. It was quite similar to the year before. 1988. Then came the watershed. To this point, the burning man had been a family picnic. It was about to become a public event. In 1988, the man was built at a garage I rented for my construction company on oh, the names Dubis du, du, du Duboki Street. <laughs> Dubok. Du ah, it's okay. Across from Ralph K. <laughs> Davis, Davis Medical Center. It was a street. Uh, <laughs> three of us worked the entire weekend for several months designing and building this 30 foot tall figure, Mike Ecker, Larry, and I. This was to be more than a friendly little statue. At this size, the figure would require true structural integrity. The design would further challenge would be further challenged by the fact that in order to fit into the shop where it was being considered and to be able to be transported to the beach and erected, it would have to be built in modules. The very first Playa Tech. <laughs> uh, I provided the design required for the structure and the modules. Regarding its appearance, it was Larry's idea the year before to use the end metered wood brackets on access as the primary design motif. He, Mike, and I collaborated on its appearance. I built the man with help from Mike. Larry tinkered. Larry's carpenter skills were limited. I built the man in component parts, legs, torso, body, arms, and the head. It was around this time that we began referring to the figure and the event as Burning Man. I still have the poster Maria produced that year bearing that title. For the most part, I had little luck enlisting my builder buddies to help until it came to the day of transport and assembling and the burn of the man. They then provided assistance that was absolutely necessary. After a couple of hours of carrying the components from the trucks to the beach, and then assembling them, we were ready for ignition. With our backs to the cliffs and the Pacific roaring in front, we prepared to pull the Burning Man from lying on its back to standing, relying on a block and fall whose stake failed and the first attempt to raise him. We nearly impaled the crowd who'd volunteered to lift them. Jeez. 63rd. On the next attempt, we depended solely on manual labor, with many pulling on a rope tied to his solar plexus and many others lifting his shoulders as his feet sunk into holes in the sand, the man was raised. What a transcendence. It was breathtaking. We'd considered that the authorities might 
take an interest in the emulsion of this thing, especially given that we were on the beach on a U.S. Army's Presidio base. We'd never ask for permission. Somewhere in this scramble, a reporter from San Francisco Focus magazine approached me. I said I was too busy for an interview, but gave him information to follow up later. There was a guy banging on a gong, some others blowing horns, and started the f- and we started the fire. Being another cold, windy night in San Francisco, the burlap newspaper and kerosene being the body of and kindling for the man burned up and blew away. We were left with a rather large, charred figure, and we were uncertain how to proceed. I tried starting the campfire at his foot. Someone else climbed the man and tried to ignite his torso. That's when the cops arrived. <laughs> there were two good uh, there were two good cops and two bad cops. And after a few threats and negotiations, they left on our promise that we'd knock it down, finish burning it, and go home. This proved to be a great solution all the way around. To satisfy my curiosity and clean up our mess, I returned to the crime scene the next morning to pick up the pieces. Later, when the San Francisco Focus Magazine's writer called, I put him in touch with Larry. Busy with a full-time job, it seemed logical to ask Larry to arrange the interview. I emphasized that I wanted to be included. Larry had hurt his back and was unemployed. He held the interview without me. Mike Ecker and I were referenced to as Larry's cohorts in the article. It was around this time that Larry and I consulted with a guy connected with San Francisco art scene named Michael Bell. In discussing our ideas for Burning Man, given its clandestine nature, Michael said, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than to beg for permission. I think that hit Larry down to the soles of his shoes. The video from the beach in 1988 shows Larry standing on the beach, hands on his hips, watching and pointing. So I'm actually, I'm interviewing Jerry James next. That's who I'm going up to San Francisco. For. That's this weekend, right? Yeah. That'll be the next episode. Yeah. So that's the teaser for his story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you'll get really in depth with. Did you, you probably talk to him for like 10 hours? Too. Yeah. All right, this next one's from Terry Pratt. He taught me a lot about a new way to look at life. Farewell, Larry. This one is from Eleanor Prager. I sat next to Larry at a luncheon for the opening of the Sismo- Sism- Smithsonian, Smithsonian <laughs> Renwick Burning Man exhibit. No spectators. We chit-chatted, and I asked him to tell me something I didn't know about him. He chuckled. That would take a while, he said. <laughs> this next one from Julia Colonier. Larry, I never personally met you, but I knew who you were. I just had a job interview at Burning Man HQ. Marion left your side at the hospital to come interview me on Friday and the next day you were gone. I wish I could have, I wish I could have met you in person so that I can tell you that I am so grateful for your legacy you have given to this world. I truly believe that Burning Man is the answer to the trauma that we experience daily in the default world. The love that is breathed back, back into the playa is spreading beyond the dust to the rest of the world. The violent history of the land and the blood stains that run deep through the soil are being healed because of Burning Man. The event, the nonprofit, the foundation, these gifts you have given, get, these gifts you have given us are the tools we need to continue your vision. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. I really hope you haunt I really hope you haunt the pyre or something so I can see you around. <laughs> Pours out one for the homies. <laughs> This next one is from Jane Morrow. The year was 2012, Black Rock City. One day our camp leader announced to us there was going to be a gathering at, in our camp, the first of its kind, with all the muckety mucks of the org and heads of various camps and that we'd need to clear out for a couple hours. Naturally, I stayed. An extra wing had been added that year to the shade structure to accommodate this catered secret meeting. I sat off to the side, out of the mix, where I could observe people unnoticed. I watched closely as the last person approached and entered. It was Larry Harvey. He came in, surveyed the scene, saw that I was in a quiet corner away from everyone and walked over. He said hello as he pulled out a pack of cigarettes and sat down next to me, lit up, turned to look at my smiling face, 
and began to tell a story about how he had a dream about the Otic Oasis before it ever came into form. As Larry spoke about that and other visions he'd had, I felt I was listening to a delighted child sharing from their imagination. There is an innocence and purity, a type of vulnerability that I typically only encounter with children, rare qualities in an adult that I value tremendously. We shared this space for about 20 minutes before Larry reluctantly let someone whisk him away from his whimsical musings. And isn't it true? Takes one to know one. The Burner family recognizes in each other our child selves, that place of open trust we share, where we build from our wildest dreams a dusty playground to laugh and be free in the wonderment of it all. 2017, Monday, early evening at the man. Someone next to me stepped at the same time onto the first step of the pavilion. We looked at each other in that moment. A couple of kids excitedly ascending the stairs of our shared dream. That was the last time I saw Larry. Tori, I could listen to you, like, read me bedtime stories. <laughs> <laughs> There's a new podcast idea. No. Yeah. <laughs> bedtime stories by, Larry, yeah. by, by Tori. Per, burner bedtime stories. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. We can have some creative stories going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. This next one's by Sarah Cranberry. Thank you, Larry Harvey. Burning Man has changed me and my life forever. I lit a candle for you. Back to Tori. I'm going to get Travs next. Yeah, Yeah. definitely do Travs. (laughs) This is from Serena Van Vranken. Burning Man gave me community when I didn't even know I was missing one. The welcome home I received my first year from strangers, both verbal and hugs, did something to change my heart. I became more open, loving, and forgiving more inclusive and less judgmental, more willing to make connections. My heart swells when I think of going home. Although Larry didn't believe in an afterlife, or so I hear, I do. What I believe is that his energy will be there this year and for years to come, welcoming us home. Thank you, Larry, for all you've done, but especially I thank you for this gift of community you've given us. All right. This, um... This next one uh, is by Travmo, the camp lead at Perky Parts. One of our favorite people in the local community here. Yeah. (laughs) It was Monday morning of my second burn, 2014. A day I will always remember. The gates around, uh, the gates should have been open by now. But heavy rains late sat at Sunday night, soaked build crews and Playa and Playa leaving the gate, no choice but to remain closed. A buddy and I went on a fool's errand to try to retrieve ice for our camp without realizing how sticky and relentless the mud would be on our wagon tires. After three hours of slowly chipping hardened playa off of our wheels, we decided to sit down and take a breather. That's when I saw him. Gray-brimmed hat, muddied rain boots, cigarette draped in his lips. He emerged with the sun from... It's the center camp, like the God I never believed in. <laughs> he kept gazing up in the sky as if to politely ask the clouds to break. So everyone at gate could finally be let in. I knew I had to seize this magic moment. I knew I had to say something. Are they opening the gate anytime soon? I yelled a few yards out to him <laughs> without expecting to be acknowledged at all. <laughs> I can just see Trav doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, are they going to open a gate in time soon? It's like that. Yeah. (laughs) He exhaled a generous puff of smoke and affirmed, Yeah, gate will be opening back up any minute. It's going to take more rain than that to slow us down. While he casually made his approach towards us. I asked him for a light. He pulled out a torch and told me to pull my face back or we'd be lighting more than my cigarette. Then we chatted. We finished our smoke, but the conversation lived on. He told me the story about the time National Guard came out and sat around the perimeter, threatening our utopia with a police state. He said, that's when I knew we really had something special. We talked politics. He asked what my camp was called and where we were placed. 445 and F, he says. F is for frankincense this year, right? as if to give himself a pat on the back for remembering the streets themes <laughs> this time around. After about 20 minutes of back and forth, my buddy asks, so uh, how many of these have you been to? 
<laughs> Before Larry could answer, I interrupt. Do you have any idea who you're talking to? And it dawned on me that this entire time, my friend had no idea who he was talking to, the very man who brought him here. Um, no, he says, as if somehow his ignorance could save him. Don't worry about it. I'll tell you later. <laughs> my buddy looks back at Larry, now curious to hear his answer. Larry pulls a cigarette out of his mouth, and as humble as burn is short, he replies, Well, uh, I've been to all of them. I remember being overcome with delight watching him be able to answer that question with such candor. I remember thinking to myself, this is the attitude I want to have. Create everything, take credit for nothing. Larry could have greeted for uh, greeted any number of 68,000 burners embarking on Playa that day, but he chose to be present with us. Just as I was ready to walk away, elated with the encounter, a group of people ran by <laughs> in their underwear covered in mud, socks dragging a foot behind them, laughter filling their hearts. Larry pointed at them and said, now those guys are doing it right. Anybody having that much fun tonight is doing it right. <laughs> and just a comment on that uh, Burning Man in 2014 when it was raining. I actually got caught in that. And one of, one of the uh, last people that was let in before it really started pouring. Oh, well. you did get in. I did get in. You didn't was... have to pee in a bucket in your car? Well, it was about four in the morning and my boyfriend at the time and I had just been driving for almost 24 hours yeah. and we didn't know how long the rains were going to last. So we wanted to set up shelter, uh, it, you know, with our headlamps and it was raining and we were slipping in the mud and I was trying to put the poles in and the lightning, you know, got to the pole through the ground and shocked my whole arm. and. Oof. Uh, I was going back and forth between just crying from being exhausted and and just wanting to go to sleep and not knowing when we were going to, you know, be able to get dry. <laughs> <laughs> That's the year me and you camped together, but we didn't know each other. Right? Uh, yeah. That was 2014 when yeah, we camped with, yeah. with Boone. And, I think um, that was okay. 2015. I think that was a Wonderlust Arcade. Yeah, that was Wonderlust Arcade. That was the next year. Yeah. The first year I accidentally camped with the people of Embrace. <laughs> oh, that was your yeah. second year. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right, bye. So, uh, thank you, Trav, for that story. Um, the man who created everything but takes credit for nothing. So, uh, the next one is from Troy Swanson. Rest in peace, Larry Harvey. It was probably after my first or second Burning Man, on one of the long drives out blissed out after a week of magic on the playa with my heart burst open and filled with gratitude for everyone and everything that had just made me see the world differently and challenged me to become a better version of myself when I took a moment to think about Larry Harvey. I recall asking myself, imagine being the one person that was responsible for activating all this magic. Imagine what it would be like to wake up every day and know that this thing that you started is now massively impacting so many people's lives and in so many different ways. Years later, I had the honor of meeting Larry in Amsterdam and chose to give him a brief thank you instead of the gushing, sharing fanboy that I probably felt like being then. Every day, each one of us is asked by people, how are you? And to those rare few that actually want an accurate, in-depth answer before responding, I quickly do a quick assessment of how I'm doing, which I'm fortunate to share that my response typically goes something like, I'm really good, I'm truly alive, and I feel like if it's my time to go tomorrow, that I have really lived, and that I gave more than I took my time here. So with the recent news of Larry's passing, I wasn't sad, but instead celebratory, as I know from friends that knew him when he knew him that he truly lived. I know that he truly gave that, that he truly gave and that he le leaves this planet with a beautiful legacy of impact and something that is set up in a way to go on for many years to come. In honoring Larry, I also recognize and give gratitude today to all of the amazing burners who have added their time, passion, and magic to making Larry's Baker Beach spark into the 87 massive multi-day burning flames around the world each year. Many I have recently the pleasure, 
Many I have recently the pleasure of meeting at Burning Man, ELS in France. The saying, it takes a village, could not be more true than the Burning Man world. Many years ago, I recognized and began sharing that attending Burning Man is the best gift I give myself each year, and I'm proud to be patch- passing the torch and amplifying Larry's legacy. In my writing about Burning Man, in my upcoming book about transformational growth experiences, I'm also proud to be playing a small part for the Burning Man. Galaxia. 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 Galaxia? Sure, yeah, Galaxia. Galaxia (laughs) Temple 2018 fundraising team this year, which I know is going to blow brighter than ever as we celebrate the life and what is now a massively huge torch that Larry passes on to all of us. Thank you, Larry, for the spark, the life you lived, and for the legacy you leave for us. Yeah, this is our very last one. Um, this is from Alpi, who was our very first online editor for Burner Podcast. If it weren't for Larry, I never would have met my family, and I never would have met myself. Um, this, uh, you know, this has been like a rough couple of weeks for me personally. And I, I, I definitely like when we learned about Larry's passing, I think it, uh, I, I definitely experienced some emotions and feelings I was not expecting to feel, (laughs) um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, we are sitting in this room right now recording this piece. The three of us have this incredible bond and we've been on these incredible adventures in no small part, thanks to, um, thanks to what Larry had envisioned and what Burning Man is, you know, like, I mean, Nav and I would have like made friends, but we wouldn't be like at the level that we're at. I think if it wasn't for Burning Man, Tori and I would have never met. It's true. And if it I, wasn't for Burning Man. If it wasn't for Burning Man and for volunteering for a random art project for my second year of the burn, I never would have met this team. And now uh, so many people from this community feel like they're my family. And um, it's really great to, to have these principles and be able to carry this lifestyle and this, mm-hmm. this community into the quote-unquote default world. Uh, yeah, no, it's, um, it's, uh, it was quite, uh, shocking when, cause I think I broke the news to everyone when we we're working, working at John's. I think we were reading stuff on Facebook. Oh, I got, yeah, yeah. I got, I got an alert. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got an alert from, um, like, a. no, 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 no you're right. I think, yeah, it was a, I, I was reading Facebook I, status updates that, that, were like I was like, wait, did Larry Harvey die? Right. And then you looked up the news and yeah. saw that the like actual legitimate places yeah. that because you never know with the burner sometimes you yeah. just troll the shit out of people. But anyways, yeah, there was just this immediate stillness. We were having a meeting for coincidentally a Burning Man <laughs> project <laughs> fundraiser. Yeah, we um, all we all just went silent. Yeah. Yeah, for like I mean, a while. And I know we don't need to like take a minute, mm. but definitely had to go outside and just like process what. Um, yeah, like we're all interconnected and we all have impacts on our life. Like very, like this whole universe is a experiment, chaos theory essentially, mm. right? Butterfly flaps swings here, things happen there. But it's very rarely you get you get direct you get direct impact from one individual and more so like a group of individuals is obviously everyone that went to that first burn on Baker's Beach. Yeah. Um made Burning Man what it is today. <clears throat> and all of them held the torch. Granted there he was the one grabbing everyone by the arm, like, here we're going this way. Mm-hmm. Um but he's given that passion to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that have been to the burn, um, to 
carry our own, carry our own torches, which is something you have done, I have done, Tori Tori has done, and that inspiration comes from from um, role models like that. So, um, yeah, my first year at the burn, I went as a spectator and I came back as a uh, participant. I was very ashamed, very ashamed of being a spectator. Once I got there, I was like, oh. I don't, I don't have anything to give to you because mm-hmm. I need electricity to do anything <laughs> as far as my skill set is concerned. And uh, it, it, it was an immediate, immediate, uh, immediate feeling of being an outsider if you were just there to spectate because you could go do that anywhere. Like yeah. this is a place where participation is encouraged and easy and, People, people that aren't so nice out here are actually way nicer in <laughs> there sometimes. Yeah. Um, and I come back and tell you about it. And like next week you're at Red Wing. Yeah. Making friends with people and you go to... Did you go to Utopia before you went to the burn? Yeah, it was Utopia. That, that was my first burn. Um, yeah. You went to Burning Man and I went to Utopia. Um, and then, then I dove headfirst in. Right. Mm-hmm. You were the art lead the next year at uh, Utopia, right? Yeah. It was... Yeah. But yeah, so, it's, yeah. It, we've, that, we've, we've spent quite a bit of time... <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, sharing our love for Burning Man and what it means and what it means to us. And when I heard the news about his passing, you know, like, the thing that I couldn't get out of my head is I didn't get to interview him. Mm. <laughs> I, I knew you were thinking that. And not, not, as, yeah, yeah. not as like, it was just... Oh, I didn't know what to make of the thought too. Because I'm like, it was we, it was strange. It was like something that was something that I felt very passionate about. And I, I dreamed about so much. Yeah. And, um, and I had so many questions to ask him. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then that was, I couldn't, I could, I could, that was a weird thing to deal with. That was so. I never. I've. I have no frame of reference for what that. Whatever that feeling is that I was feeling, I have no idea what that. Yeah, feels like. it's that feeling is, is never. Yeah, it's the purest form of it, which we never really get to experience that often. Like a very yeah. distinct, sharp version of what never means. Um, yeah, because there's uh, nothing that's never. Honestly, I mean, like <laughs> Vla- interviewing Vladimir Putin doesn't seem like, like it might be like a, you know, like a point point zero 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 one percent possibility. Yeah. But like, yeah, the Larry Harvey interview is, well, that, that was the first time something like that had ever hit me. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, I, I, I go through that quite a bit at like just funerals. It's just a very stark facing of like mm. this never say never like, well like, this fucking is that's just never um and it kind of takes over you and blows you back but um that's what life is right yeah. it's experiences yeah this is an experience that we get to have now yeah, well and for um i mean you know some people might feel like you know they're just waiting to go home to be at burning man but there's kind of, you know, the thought process too, that it's something that you're, the principles and the feeling and, you know, being our, our friend group here that we have and being with you guys and having your support, it feels more at home and like I'm burning all year long. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you had mentioned that Utopia was your first burn. Um, you know, there's, there's burns all over the world. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, it doesn't just have to be this one week of the year to celebrate or feel this way. I'm hoping that everyone can continue to, you know, keep those feelings with them and grow from it. Oh, well. All right. I'm really glad we did this. I feel, I like, I physically feel different than when we first started. I think you could like hear it in our voices too, as we like went through reading these. Yeah, definitely. That might well, most of my readings were poor anyways, but I got I got more comfortable yeah. at the end and yeah. actually had some character in my voice. <laughs> it, was, it was a good it was a good processing experience. All right. Well, thanks guys. And uh, listeners, next week we will return you to your regularly scheduled programming.
See you at the burn. Welcome home.